Hello, welcome to this Open Security Summit session in June 2023. And we have Gabriel, who's going to do another session on the absolutely super critical topic, important topic of access controls and how to scale with Opal. And we already had a number of sessions on last summit on this, and this is a great continuation. So, Gabriel, over to you. Yeah, so good to be here, and thank you for the intro. Um, as you know, we all like do security all day, and we always hear that term, like the shift left term. And if I ask you, what is shift left? You know, so anyone has like a different answer for what we are shifting left, what we are doing. But the main point, you know, is about having the security there from the really beginning of the software development life cycle. Um, and to describe it more, you know, I just used, and as, you know, say, ChatGPT, generative AI, to ask what is probably shift left. And the answer is, is a nice answer. And I think it can summarize the way how developer and security people referring to shift left. So we want to create proactive measures much before we are getting to the application, right? So instead of running tools of application security, So instead of um, using application security tools, when we are delivering the applications, we better to run those tools in a proactive way at the minute where we start to developing software. And also if we look, you know, on all the tools at the um, shift left ecosystem, we can see tools that probably started much before we even think of the application. So from the planning even we have like ide plugins and then when we develop and we try you know to commit changes we have another tool to measure if we have secret and we can go right at the picture because um we can go right at the picture to see how we took all those tools from analyzing applications to analyze code and measure proactive security at the code itself but the way shift left uh, landscape today works has inherent an internal problem with it. And this problem is that developers, developers don't like that you measure them. Developers don't like integration. If we look on all those tools, those tools are just creating more and more work to develop. So is that a good thing to be proactive in measurement or just create much more for developers? Right. So in my opinion, instead of measure where we are doing shift left, we should use the influence term. When we are thinking on shift left, when we are looking at the tools before, we're not supposed to do the security analysis as we know it from, you know, the beginning days of application security that we analyze and measure our software security, we should influence security. So every time we are looking at the software development lifecycle and trying to shift left the way we are doing security, I think we need to change our term from proactive measurement to proactive influence. And today, what we are going to do is show a case study how could we, in the application level, access control to influencing and then not measurement? In a traditional way of application level uh, and the shift left hype, the way that we are actually protecting access control is by analyzing. We are analyzing the code to see there is no flaws in access control. And then we are using dynamic application security tools. And yet, we just create more work for developers and make them do not want to do security. In our case study today, we will think how can we, as a security engineer, influence the way developers do a better application level access control. My name is Gabriel, and I am the head of DevRel at Permit.io. In Permit.io, we invest our time in create better access control experience for developers. We are developing an authorization as a service product. So instead of developer just developers just creating their own authorization and do it again and again and suffer security flaws that you 
may or may not cannot verify with uh, your DevSecOps or shift left tools, we are actually giving you a better infrastructure to create secure authorization. Today, we are going to talk on some of the open source tools that we create and how you as a security engineer can influence security by using those open source tools. So if we look on access control, there are two main phases of access control. The first one is authentication, of course, and all the logos you see here is actually authentication as a service provider. And these are the big one, but if you look at the internet, you'll find dozens of companies that do the same. They save the developers a lot of work around authentication, it means verify who the users are, but when developers try to see what the user can do, they have nothing to do. Sometimes they are providing like a, some level of authorization, but for good security, you need to do fine-grained authorization. It means you need to make much better decisions than just if I can verify these users or not. And the reason why there are so much tools and what we want to do in authorization is get out of the comfort zone. The way all those tools do authentication is let the developer write a very simple code in their application. They are giving you in a various SDK, a user object as the left side, and then the developer can verify if a user can or cannot do something. But the way to get to authorization, get out of the comfort zone and do the same like if statement to check if a user can do something is much complex. Probably the tools that letting you do the if on the right side, if a user action and resource is allowed, there are not much tools like that. Permit does it. But if developers want to develop authorization themselves, it's very hard to do it. So what do we want to do is understanding why it's so hard to develop authorization yourself. Why developers are not going out from the comfort zone. And if they go, they do something wrong. So let's look on a typical way of implementing authorization in application. So it always starts with like decorators. Decorators is the one we see here under the endpoint. And this is the way most of the web framework working today. You use a decorator. And then, for example, the security requirement is that admin users and only admin users will be able to perform some operation on some resources. So the developer create like a middleware, a function that will run just before the authorization, the endpoint will call and check if a user has a role admin. Okay, that's a very simple beginning. But security has more requirement than that. So maybe we want, for example, from the security perspective of our application, or maybe the usability perspective of our application, that admin and paid users will be able to perform an operation on a resource. And then the developers just create more complex code in the middleware to allow to decorators to roll to get for a various endpoint, but maybe. But if we look here on the evolution of the complexity of authorization in application, it's really hard for security analysis because what, we can, what you can do now with all this independent authorization code to verify in the shift left manner that authorization is in a good statement in your application, is run dynamic tools because you have nothing to do with this code to understand if your application is secure currently. And that's even being harder when the application get complex. So for example, if you have a security or usability requirement to support more complex permissions model, like I want a user from the location EU without any kind of role to get access because I have like, regulation terms and stuff like that, the code is getting more complex, but our work as security engineer get an even much complex because we still have no idea how to analyze and respect and audit what happened in this 
authorization decision. And as you can see here, and this is a standard evolution for every kind of authorization internal framework. And if you probably work on a product that implement extensive authorization framework, you probably know that code and you know that problem. The problem that you have no eyes on what happened in the authorization access control of your application. So we need a better way to think of authorization. And I think the biggest problem in the way developers do authorizations today is started with this sentence. So usually when you go to developer and you ask him if they do authorization, they will tell you no, but we need to implement our back to an application. This is actually how developers usually, um, those terms are problematic for us because they are very, very specific for the implementation details of the app that they are doing today. So we don't want developers to implement RBAC to an application. We want them to enforce permission in application because the way we see it from the security perspective is much more than, than, than just implementing one permission model, also known as RBAC, to an application. We want to have an extensive, extensive and comprehensive authorization system that our developer implement in application, but at the step they need to implement it. We want to have everything to support in from, from to be state of the art from the security perspective of it. So before we are diving to how a good authorization system looks like, let's take a short look to remind what is what are the permissions model that we could have in authorization system. So we will talk today about four permissions model, ACL, the access control is, RBAC, ABAC, and RBAC, which are currently the most common permission model for application level security. The access control list is the old one, and sometime from unknown reason, security people really like it, but I think is not fit for the modern uh, application level authorization. And I'll explain. Access control is actually known very well on network auth and firewall because we have like a list, a long list of users that is allowed to do an operation. And this is very comfortable when you try to audit and analyze because you can always uh, um, check what a user in what list a user are, right? Even before running the decision, you can have a very clear view on what users or endpoint or whatever it is can or cannot do. But in application level security, usually the permission are much, much complex than that. And not only that, you need some, somehow to maintain all those lists. And then developers and application are not lived so well with access control lists. And then we have our world-based access control. And for a good reason, this is the widely used model for application authorization because it's balanced between the product requirement and the complexity of defining authorization system. In RBAC, we are assigning roles to user or some users or some roles to some users. And then we can create a nice readable rules that, st that state which roles can perform which operation like create or delete on particular resources. RBAC is easy because it's very easy for, let's say the product managers to define it. They are thinking of roles. They don't know all our granularity level of the attribute in the system. So they are saying, okay, fine. Give me three roles, admin viewer and moderator. And this is the, the permission that you give them. In software, it's also easy to implement it because usually you have lots of framework that work together with the software that you develop. But from security and advanced use cases, that's not the best permission you can get because sometimes you want a better granularity on the resource level. So for example, I don't want all the documents considered as document. And first, sometimes you need some more granular level on the user itself. You want to inspect the attribute that the users belong to. 
And this is where probably the most complex permission model came to the picture, attribute-based access control, ABAC. In ABAC, you can actually do everything because you have a top granular level of the operation. Like we can see in the middle here, drive, chill, and eat. But in the resource and users, you have as many attributes as you want. So for example, I can inspect a very low level of granularity on the users and the resources that I want to define permission for. Doing ABAC is actually, from the security perspective, give you the best granular level of security you want to get. But in the other end, it's hard to analyze any spec because decision can get a very, very hard way to make, right? If I want to get a decision that evolve attributes from everywhere on the users and their resources, it could get really hard. But again, it lets you create a very good level of authorization. In some application, particularly consumer application, we will want to get a decision based on the relationship, but not only relationship between the explicit relationship between, let's say, document and user. If a document belongs to the user, let them do something. We want to create reverse indices. So for example, we want a user that they are uh, part of organization in four level, right? So if under a VP of engineering, I want, uh, I want to get access to any document related to the VP of engineering group. So if, for example, I have a team which is like third level cousin of me, I want them, uh, I want to get access to their application. So Reback aimed to bring a very simple rule level, like if I'm on the same relation with something, give me permission. But in the other end, it require, require you to save a lot of data. So from the development perspective, implementing Reback without an external system is a huge challenge. So Reback is something which is very use case specific, but from the security perspective, you sometimes really want to make sure you are supporting it. And let's go back to the implementation of authorization. And okay, we, we decided to continue with the way of we are letting the developers develop authorization themselves, but then someone snicked the system, right? And you probably know that because most of the CVEs, which are like, you know, like in the organization level, most of the CVEs are usually related to access control. So you are like getting a new case and someone get an unverifiable system, uh, access to your system. And you don't have an authorization system as a security engineer. So you go to the code and you have no idea why that happened, right? There is the middleware, there is the framework that they, they promised you will work great um, from the security perspective. But you look at the code and you know nothing, why that happened. The reason why that happened is because a very smart developer decided to do not use the framework and just put an if statement somewhere, decide if a user get access or not to something. Now this over sophisticated if statement actually just let an uh, unverified user to get into some resource. And this is something we really want to avoid when developers are doing authorization. And as we say before, when we uh, when we are today doing like Cleft and DevSecOps, all the tools that we, we we saw are actually help us in me measure the way we have access control. What we want to do today is think about how we influencing for our developers in having a better authorization system, and this is what we are going to talk today. So first, let's think how the autonomous authorization lifecycle look like. So we can see here that we want to author the policies, right? This is the first thing. As a security engineer or any other function in our uh, organization, we want to get the ability to author, to create, we and then 
and then we want to audit it, right? We want to get an uh, audit of what happened in the decision. And we want this autonomous system to patiently able to consume our authorization lifecycle without uh, changes in the code, for example. We want to be able to audit no matter what to application in a particular point. We want to be able to author the policies without any kind of, you know, or authorize the user without any kind of relationships to the application themselves. So that's, this is the first thing when we are thinking an authorization system, we want to think how do we create better autonomous authorization lifecycle outside of our application. The second point that we know that we need uh, something that is separate from the system itself is thinking of developer experience. As we discussed before, if we will have something which is, for example, not cross-platform enforcement, so the developers need to develop extensive layer for each application that they are used just to enforce the permission, to enforce the policy that we create, that will be problematic for us. And we want them, we want our authorization system to be able easily to enforce all the permission in any platform that our developers will need. And also because the developers need to enforce permissions everywhere, we want our authorization system to be performance aware. We don't want an authorization system that can stack the, call, the API calls for the developers. We also want it to have a zero effort deployment. If, for example, we are now going to the developers and tell them, hey, we think that we need to influence the way you do authorization or the way you do access control, and you need now to create a new whole extensive system, they will say, okay, I'll prioritize it to never. So we need to find something which developer can deploy easily. We also wanted to have decentralized architecture. One of the things that we saw problematic with uh, Ombud created authorization, with authorization that to create in code, is like something that lives together with the application. And applications today can be everywhere, right? We have like uh, microservices that can go uh, in a different deployment, in a different environment, in a different cloud. So we want our policy system to be unified or maybe even centralized, but support in decentralized applications. And also we wanted to have a seamless data and configuration syncing. So think of all the data we need to have when we are analyzing policy, right? We have data from everywhere, can be from identity management, can be from system that we have, can be from security system. We want for data from uh, IP core systems. And we also have, we was, we also need to let the developer um, acknowledge that the system is always in sync with the permission configuration that we do for their right experience that syncing the data and the configuration into the authorization system. So this is actually the requirement from the DevEx that we must have in the authorization system, we want to influence in a way that developers adopt our recommendation and not just throw it to the backlog. Looking from the other perspective, what are the best practices of this secure authorization system? So if we want to design a system, uh, we need it to be agnostic to the permissions model, right? So we did, we talk about RBAC, ABAC, we want our system to work with any kind of permission model that we need at the time. We want, as we saw, to decouple the policy from code. So developers will not have like the chance to create permissions in the code itself. As we saw, this can let let let, let some developer create a bad uh, a policy that we cannot track, cannot manage. We want it, of course, to be influenced by security. DevX in a first mind and to be centralized lifecycle control, but decentralized architecture. So let's see how can we build such authorization system. The first step to build such authorization system is create contract because contract create better relationships. And here we need to build two very important relationships. First one, we want to build a relationship between um, 
the teams. We want to build a relationship between security teams and development teams. And we also w- want to build a better relationship between systems, between authorization systems and application. So how those contracts look like? Contract needs to be first part in configuration. We want to have a very clear contract. How do we configure policies? How do we configure permissions for authorization? And we also we want also to have a contract how we execute this configuration, right? So first is config and then is to execute it. Let's see how could we build such contract. So today we are going to speak about three types of contracts. The first one is open policy agent. All right. The second is a new language released by AWS called AWS Cedar. And third is implementation that's based on Google Zanzibar. And let's dive into each of those contracts and understand the different and how can we choose the right one for us. Hint, today we are going to choose AWS Cedar. So first, this is Open Policy Agent, and this is the configuration contract. What you can see here is a language called Rigo. Rigo is a language to express policies. In the left side, we have an example of how to express RBAC policies. So first, we can see that we are like having in the same as every policy uh, programming language import and all the necessary parts. We always started f- starting from a point that allow is false because here we want to get a binary decision. We want to get a decision if a user is allowed or not allowed to do something. And then we express the what we wrote in imperative code that we saw before, we express it in declarative configuration here. So for example, we can see that only if a user is granted permission by being admin in its roles, it getting allowed to be true. In the right side, we can see a declaration of a much complex policy. So for, for example, we can see functions that declare user is employee by having a user title that equals to employee. Or we can even create much complex condition like user tenor is eight or greater than eight. This is the contract that the open policy agent actually exposed to us, exposed to us in the configuration part. And then we also have a policy agent, an engine that can process this language, can process this declaration of configuration and run it to get a better decision. Open Policy Agent is pretty old in the market. It also has a wide ecosystem that we can give to the uh, developers to integrate with their applications. But it also has some cons um, because it's so comprehensive and actually fit for a lot of types of policies. So for example, one of the most wide use case of Open Policy Agent is admissions. When we are delivering resources to the cloud, we want to get a decision what can deliver, what can go where, etc. And as you can see uh, from Open Policy Agent language from Rigo, it's a rich, it has a rich support in features. So you can probably do anything with it. When it goes to application security, sometimes developers complain that it's hard for them to learn it. And it also has like a problem with data because you can cache the data to get decisions on uh, open policy agent, but it could be really hard for you uh, if you need a lot of data. So for example, uh, open policy agent have like um, limitation in the data that you can hold for each policy agent. The other side of Open Policy Agent is a paper that's released by Google called Google Zanzibar. If you remember, before we spoke about um, relationship-based architecture, uh, relationship-based policies. And if you, if you think on Google, right, so think of Google like a company that has YouTube, Drive, Google Cloud, and on top of all, I have one identity, right? I have my own Google identity. And I can, for example, upload uh, YouTube videos from my personal account to my Google Drive files and sync them together. 
And Google need to manage all these authorization that are very complex. If we look on ABAC, if you look on the way to declare a policy, it's really hard to track all the relationship between permissions, right? In ABAC, I can look on a lot of attributes of my identity, but if, for example, I want to get a decision between a four systems based on my relationship, it's getting hard. It's probably getting even harder when I want to go back on the track and uh, see some attributes that will help me get a better decision. So we will release the paper called uh, Zanzibar that uh, explain or like um, describe an authorization system that based on graph database and the result of this graph database is node that, that declare if a user allowed or not allowed to perform an operation. Usually uh, there are some implementations for Zanzibar, but the one that we want to speak about today is OpenFGA because in my opinion, this is the simplest one for uh, making application level authorization. OpenFGA, as you can see here, is let you configure very nice structure of policy by the relationship. So here, for example, we can see that we, we have like uh, user types, and then we can see that we want to have them directly related, which can express some type of relationship or indirectly related to a user. And by expressing those relationship, we can get policy decisions. If we look at, um, Open policy agent and open FGA, we can see um, two corners of policy uh, systems. In one hand, we have the very complex attribute based um, access control, which actually can be based on a lot of attribute and we can create probably really, really complex uh, rules that run really fast because open policy agent knows how to do this like modeling the attribute-based access control really well. But and in the other end, you have like the Google Zanzibar and the OpenFGA that can analyze a relationship-based decision, but cannot analyze, uh, cannot efficiently analyze complex uh, attribute decision. You need to be very clear and specific and actually save it in the graph DB uh, to make sure you're getting right uh, authorization decision. Look at the Zanzibar Open FGA. So as we said, we can create simple reback relationship based access, access control. But when we need to do R back and A back, it's getting complex. It supports reverse indices because you have like the graph database that can save and track all those uh, uh, indices. Um, and also it's stateful. And this is actually another challenge. So we remember about the way you deploy and do decentralized way of uh, authorization system. The Google Zanzibar is actually centralized. You need the principles of the authorization. And because of that, it's getting hard sometimes for developer to deploy it or maybe expensive because they need like a lot of memory and machines to run all this data and graph data. A new contract that called CEDAR. And CEDAR is actually kind of best of both worlds. First, it is designed as a language for application level authorization. And soon I'll explain more on that, but just at the beginning, if we look here, CDAR always has a binary answer, permit or denied. Not like open policy agent, for example, that you can get a lot of answers. Actually, you can declare what is the permission answer that you'll get. In CDAR, you get either permit or denied. And also you always take into account three principles principal, which is the user, action, which is like the operation you want to perform in a resource. And if we look at all the permission models that we have for application, this is usually the way we would like to get a decision based on. And it also support one level of reverse indices. So by, if you can see the when, you can see that we are like creating or like maintaining relationship between um, 
entities in our system. And then we can create a lightweight or get a lightweight of Reebok relationship-based access control that is actually easier to develop than in open policy agent. What makes it our, um, so what makes it our mapping so good? So the first one, and as I said, is that it first designed an application authorization language, which is a really good one because the other contract either designed as a multi-purpose language or specific for Reebok. Either is designed for to be permission agnostic, permission model agnostic, but for the application level authorization. It also supports Reebok easily via ABAC. And yes, OPA also supports Reebok, but in a harder way. And it's also a benchmark cleaner, even for Reebok and ABAC with a lot of data. And we'll see soon how that happened. And so let's explain why CEDAR is the best of both worlds. So we already mentioned the thing with the three principles. In application level authorization, when we want to get a policy decision or when we want to analyze or audit the policy decision that happened, we always ask a question that includes three principles. Does user allow to perform action on a resource or is a monkey allowed to eat a banana? The way that CEDAR policy expressed with those three principles made it very easy to author and also very easy to analyze and audit because we always know in a very strict way what are the principles made in our specific or particular policy decision. And this is making it very easy and comfortable and also with a good experience for developers who want to uh, implement CDR in their as their authorization system. And also another thing, and we mentioned it before, is the CDR entity. So not like open policy agent that support a very, uh, a very, you know, you, you can create, you can use any data that you want to get policy decision or a Zanzibar that require you to have a very specific graph database, CDAR is a compromise between a specific structure of data. So to get data into CDAR, you need it to be in a structure called CDAR entities. And we'll explain some what you see here in the entities, but is not that complex and centralized as Reebok has. And this is why CDR is Excel in benchmarking, even if you need to do some relationship-based authorization or complex attribute-based authorization. So for example, if we look at the left side, we can see an entity of a user, right? So we have here an admin user of a blog application, and we can see in the parents that this one is actually related to the role admin. It's a child of a role admin. So here we can see like a relationship that based on attributes, but so it's not hard to define. We don't need to keep it on a centralized graph because we can slice it for the particular authorization decision we need to make. And so on, so forth. So every CDR entity as entity as always the ID, the parents and the attributes. And with those both uh, three types of entities, we can get really fast decision on a complex attribute-based access control rules, even if they are in relationship-based access control manner, right? So this is actually the balance that makes CEDAR to work with the both uh, um, benefits of ABAC and REBAC system. So how the authorization lifecycle looks when we are thinking of CEDAR. So first we have the CEDAR files, which is the policy that we defined that we saw before how the CDR policy looks like. And then we have like the CDR agent or the SDK that help us to get a decision and analyze them to see why a decision happened. And then we have like CDR agent logs that we can audit, right? CDR agent is like decision engine that can get CDR as a configuration, CDR policy as a configuration and data as CDR entities and get a decision based on. Now the application in the middle can use agnostic HTTP API to the CDR agent or to the audit logs or to the where we store the CDR file and 
getting much better life cycle that is actually independent to the application themselves. But if we think on a policy language, it's not only the CDAR agent. So let's dive into each part of the policy system that we want to build, the, the authorization system we want to build, and understand how should an authorization system looks like from the architecture perspective. So first, we have a CDAR agent. CDAR agent is an open source project that actually um, maintained and created by Permit IO. And it wrapped the CDR engine, the engine that can get policy decisions based on CDR policies, and let you run it as a container. And also it has a very sophisticated deployment model. So if your developers want to start to use CDR, they don't need to get the overhead or the trade-off to implement CDR engines into their application. They can just use CDR agent as a sidecar container. And in the demo, we'll show more how it is looking automatic deployment. So instead of your developers to develop those like imperative statements or use the CDR SDK to get policy decisions, they can first use the CDR agent uh, in their application to get you a better policy decision. Hey, Gabriel, just a quick question. When you talk about sidecar, sure. are you, is this a Kubernetes? Reference or is well, it so, concept that no, you So when I when I refer to sidecar, I'm referring to the design part of sidecar. So sidecar is also known in Kubernetes, or sidecar you run for a pod, but for every kind of um, uh, container architecture or microservice architecture, there is a abstract design pattern of sidecar, right? So this is like a service that you are running as a sidecar to your application, which is probably stateless and managing automatic deployment model. So of course it can work in Kubernetes and it also is like an example of Helm chart for Kubernetes, but it can work for any kind of um, microservice architecture. Cool. So basically what you're saying is that this agent runs almost, actually I guess the word is agent, isn't it? Almost as a little agent on the application that it's, it's, it's there that the app will call, get the decision and then continue. Correct. Correct. And also in a very, you know, like abstract HTTP API. If you scan yeah. this QR code, this is actually the um, GitHub repository with all the explanation related to CDR agent. Yeah, yeah. The cool. no, no, that, that, that's really powerful because I think it solves a lot of the, the performance considerations when you have these solutions, right? So cool, cool pattern. All right, good stuff. Yeah, definitely. And also, also if you think of it, um, the way Cedar work is like an SDK that based on Rust language, Cedar agent make it cross platform. You can run it everywhere. You can get like a generic API to call it from everywhere. Perfect. The second point of authorization system is the policy store. Now that our policy is actually expressed as code or declared as code, we need to store it somewhere. Of course, we can store it in any kind of uh, file system, but we will want to use Git benefits or Git features to store our policy. So for example, what if we will have a separate branches for a separate environment? So we can, for example, test some policies in our staging by pushing it to the staging branch and other policies in production. Use Git repositories as a store for all our uh, policies code file can help us to create much safer policies without being depend on developers. So think of the way today you can ask developers, okay, I need to run some performance test on staging and I need some different permission. If you use like a Git repository from the security perspective as the store for all the policies that you author or any other function or organization author, you can get great principles that actually help you to store the policy and analyze and um, audit them in every environment and every step of the product. The other side of the policy configuration is the data itself, right? So we need data to run policy on. We need user attributes. We need user roles. We need resource attributes. We need maybe data from third-party system. So when we build authorization system, we need to think how we store data. 
Actually, because of today, we have multiple sources of data. One of the design pattern called data fetchers, and we'll speak about it soon. And this is actually a design pattern that help us fetch data from multiple sources and then help us to create much better policy decisions based on rate data in a real time. And then we need also an administration layer. Now that we have all those three points, right? So we have the decision point when we do the decision of all our policy. We have the store of the policies and we have the application that want to enforce the policy. We want to have like a component that manage it all together. And this is actually helping you create a comprehensive authorization system. It is an open source created by Permit. And it has a very nice example how you can deploy it with seamless integration into any kind of uh, architecture of modern cloud native or just cloud architecture you have today. Opal, and we talk about a lot of implementation details and the way to create authorization system. Opal is actually the basic building block for authorization system, because as you can see here, Opal is combined from a server and client architecture. The server is the point that you connect to your Git repository where you store all the policy files. The server is also um, responsible for clients. Clients is a wrapper around the policy agent, in our case, CDR agent, and it also has data features. So if we speak on data store, instead of having a data store for our uh, um, specific implementation of authorization, Opal is actually help us to fetch the data from multiple sources and have it, for, have it available for our authorization check. Another good point of Opal is that exposing, Opal exposing unified API for any kind of policy agent that you will run. So for example, if you want to run CIDR, but then you decide that you are a polyglot and you want to support another policy agent, the API that you will use to get the policy decision will always stay the same. Using Opal as a level of abstraction that will make your developers happy in creating external authorization system and you happy because it will let you in one place to track, author, analyze and audit all the policy. The last part of policy system is the part again that related to authorities, to the developers themselves. Looking at this code example, we can see here JavaScript code in the right side and Python code in the left side. And this code is actually really easy to implement. If you remember the authorization comfort zone we want to get for, this is what we get here. We have uh, one API call to is authorized. And of course, uh, it should be very fast because as you can see here, we are actually called to the sidecar that's running together to our application. And we are giving them the three principles, principal action and resource. We, in, in a way that we are externalizing authorization system, if we are tracking all what we discussed in this talk about external authorization system, what the developer left to do in the application is only the simple authorization request to the external authorization system that make it very comfortable and we hope will help developer get out from the authentication comfort zone and get to a better authorization. And also for us as security engineers, get much better security in the application level authorization system. How does a CDR based authorization system look like? So uh, this is the abstract way to describe it. We have the agent in the middle, which is the most critical part, the part of the taking authorization decision. This agent is PubSub with the Opal server with the configuration of the CDR policy we have in the Git repository. And it also connects with all the data features. And in the other side, we have the enforcement point that call the CDR agent into the application. Now that we understand how the system looks like, it's time for a demo. Let's take a short look how a full authorization system look like in one Docker file. So 
This is actually a public available repository. You can get it um, on Opal Cedar. I'll share the link after the demo. And let's look, we have here a Docker Compose file. Docker Compose file is a way to describe the whole system by configuring it, configuring the infrastructure. This Docker Compose file is actually a comp comprehensive authorization system that look exactly as we see here. So first, we are declaring the data source. Okay, this is actually the fetchers where we will get data into our CDR decision. In a real world, of course, you will connect it to your uh, all this data fetcher instead of a local Nginx server that will return this data file, you will connect it into a real world uh, data that you have and also goes to be point so that you could also add actually authorization to the to the CEDA system itself in here isn't it um because so to make sure that for example only only the right container is talking to the CEDA system so you can also here Correct. you can actually write the right keys so that is set up in a way that it's already locked down Correct, exactly. Yeah. So this is a very, very basic example of the data uh, that we are consuming on the authorization. But of course, you can plug it to your system and create like a seamless deployment model for your developers. Yeah. Right. And here we are configuring, this is actually a kind of a hack. We are having like a local Git repository. Um, we don't need it in production because we'll just use a standard Git repository with access only to our uh, CDAR system. But, but and just, here just, we are just, just on that one, like that's super important, right? You're basically also saying that the policy itself will be described in the Git, right? So the so mm -hmm. almost like the policy, and, and this is a, I, I don't think it should be underestimated, right? The fact that you can now manage your policies using Git, i.e., version control is a massive thing because that allows change control, allows revisions, and allows rollbacks, allows a whole level of workflows that can only be built on top of it to make it smoother, but you have almost Git as your source of truth for your exactly. uh, thing. And that, that I think that's massive, right? And I, I feel that that's sometimes easy, easy to underestimate, but that underpins such a, a powerful set of technological decisions. And, and I, I totally agree with it. So yeah. the way you can use like all the GitOps stuff, you know, having like branching strategies and preview environment, etc., yeah. in your policy is a game changer for the security perspective of managing and controlling policy. I, I do think that, you know, when you talk about this, I do feel that sometimes that gets lost in the message. And I feel that it, it's a fundamental part of this. And I, my, my recommendation here would be, I think sometimes if you start saying, this is a version control RBAC solution, that immediately is way more interesting. Do you know what I mean? And, and all these technologies allow that to happen, but I like I, you know, I'm a big fan of that, right? Like if I'm trying to push a lot of my team to think in version control into everything we do from policies to everything mm -hmm. should be version control. Right, so I'm, I'm trying to get all my team to to know how to use Git, to know how to use revisions, to to do a flow where you kind of have branches and then dev and then you release it, right? And then everything again is it, that also allows a CI pipeline. So it's almost like if you think about exactly. it, it's a, it's a CI pipeline version control RBAC solution, and that's freaking awesome, right? Especially when you compare the other world, which is full of black magic and proprietary stuff and things that you don't control and then, you know, and that becomes super difficult. So yeah, this is really, really cool. So yeah, definitely. The way we are using version control policy is, yeah, I mean, it's a, as you say, a massive thing for a better access control in our application. Yeah. yeah. Great. And then we have like the Opal server. This is actually where we declare our uh, yeah, declare the server that's running the Opal. And here, here we, you can see all the nice stuff that Opal supports. So for example, here is the repo URL, right? We can declare yeah. it where the uh, uh, repository or the policy store it. We can also say which is the main branch. And then we can configure a different server against different branches. So for example, if we have the Opal server of staging, we can configure here staging branch. 
And then we also can configure the polling interval. We can also create a webhook, but uh, it's a bit complex for the demo. So just to remember, then, so from, a, from a scaling point of view, what you're saying is that you have the Opal server, which will be like the enterprise big deployment that happens in an organization. And then you have the sidecar that synchronizes that, but is used for scalability and to allow quick requests. So you mm -hmm. don't have the problem of the overhead of the central server. Is that exactly. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. So the server itself is like a central server that you deploy once. But yeah. then if we look here, we also have the Opal client. Opal yeah, yeah. client is the wrapper of the policy agent. So this it, it has like a out of box scaling mechanism that helps you to deploy it seamlessly in a centralized way for syncing everything and decentralized way to get the policy decision. Think of yeah. it like the control plane and the data yeah. plane. The that server is, is actually really cool. That is really, yeah. really cool because that, again, that and tied up with the, the Git version gives you a really nice scalable platform. Exactly. Yeah, cool. exactly. Yeah, and here we also have the client and everything. Uh, we are kind of out of time, so I'll just share with you the link to the repo and then you can run it locally and see exactly how it works. There is also a nice article that explains how to get everything with this repository. But in a nutshell, this Docker file is a complete and comprehensive and as uh, and as you said um git based or version based authorization system that you all can use just out of box to start manage a better access control in your application so thank you very much for listening um we are always happy to get stars on our project on github so this um QR code will let you to see our agent and we'll be happy to get a GitHub star there. And thank you for joining me today. Wish you all better access control and better theatering. Very cool, man. And, and actually, this is like this is a great example of what I was talking earlier. I right? like I think, you know, the, even, you know, even the, the first part of this session is such a great case study of, of how we want the modern, you know, you know, teams to think about. In fact, in fact how the security teams. Think about for me there should be mandatory viewing for for the security teams to try to understand um you know this world right and 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 look i i think more and more like some of the biggest gaps we have in organizations is actually access control is the thing that bites you all the time and it's always a visualization and i really want to get to the point where you know all these SaaS systems that we use i can actually start to also get this kind of data from them because that will like, give me a much better understanding of what they actually are doing and how they implement that, it. That's a great direction. You have you know, a, I mean? you like, know, like you know, a imagine, standard uh, way that you can yeah, use all you know, the SaaS you use in software. Exactly, right? Like because what's third cool about, party yeah, yeah. authorization. And what's cool about that's this cool. is it, it creates a good standard, right? So imagine I go to five, imagine we're evaluating three SaaS providers. I go, cool, show me your, you know, open rules. Show me your rules of, you know, or your see that rules right see that. and is, is either they have that or they have something equivalent or they don't have and then i'm even more worried because how the hell are you actually managing your your authorization so definitely um, really cool man I, I don't think we've got questions here i was chipping in and you answered all my questions during the presentation really good cool. so i'll see you next time see you thank you